Around the World in 80 Days by Jules Verne. Chapter 6 In which Fix, the detective, betrays a very natural impatience. The circumstances under which this telegraphic dispatch about Phileas Fogg was sent were as follows. The steamer Mongolia, belonging to the Peninsular and Oriental Company, built of iron of 2,800 tons burden and 500 horsepower, was due at 11 o'clock a.m. on Wednesday, the 9th of October, at Suez. The Mongolia plied regularly between Rindizi and Bombay via the Suez Canal and was one of the fastest steamers belonging to the company, always making more than 10 knots an hour between Brindisi and Suez, and nine and a half between Suez and Bombay. Two men were promenading up and down the wharves, among the crowd of natives and strangers who were so sojouring at this once straggling village. Now, thanks to the enterprise of M. Lesseps, a fast-growing town. One was the British consul at Suez, who, despite the prophecies of the English government and the unfavorable predictions of Stevenson, was in the habit of seeing, from his office window, English ships daily passing to and fro on the Great Canal, by which the old roundabout route from England to India by the Cape of Good Hope was abridged by at least a half. The other was a small, slight-built personage and with a nervous, intelligent face and bright eyes peering out from under eyebrows, which he was incessantly twitching. He was just now manifesting unmistakable signs of imp impatience, nervously pacing up and down, and unable to stand still for a moment. This was Fix, one of the detectives who had been dispatched from England in search of the bank robber. It was his task to narrowly watch every passenger who arrived at Suez and to follow up all who seemed to be suspicious characters, or bore a resemblance to the description of the criminal, which he had received two days before from the police headquarters at London. The detective was evidently inspired by the hope of obtaining a splendid reward, which would be the prize of success, and awaited with a feverish impatience, easy to understand, the arrival of the steamer Mongolia. So you say, Consul, asked he for the twelfth, twentieth time, that this steamer is never behind time? No, Mr. Fix, replied the Consul. She was bespoken yesterday at Port Said, and the rest of the way is of no account to such a craft. I repeat that the Mongolia has, bege has been in advance of the time required by the company's regulations, and gained the prize awarded for excess of speed. Does she come directly from Brindisi? Directly from Brindisi. She takes on the Indian mails there, and she left there Saturday at 5 p.m. Have patience, Mr. Fix. She will not be late. But really, I don't see how, from the description you have, you will be able to recognize your man, even if he is on board the Mongolia. A man rather feels the presence of these fellows, Consul, then recognizes them. You must have a scent for them, and a scent is like a sixth sense, which combines hearing, seeing, and smelling. I've arrested more than one of these gentlemen in my time, and if my thief is on board, I'll answer for it. He'll not slip through my fingers. I hope so, Mr. Fix, for it was a heavy robbery. A magnificent robbery, Consul. Fifty-five thousand pounds. We don't often have such windfalls. Burglars are getting to be so contemptible nowadays. A fellow gets hung for a handful of shillings. Mr. Fix, said the consul, I like your way of talking and hope you'll succeed, but I fear you will find it far from easy. Don't you see? The description which you have there has a singular resemblance to an honest man. Consul, remarked the detective dogmatically, great robbers always resemble honest folks. 
fellows who have rascally faces have only one course to take, and that is to remain honest. Otherwise, they would be arrested offhand. The artistic thing is to unmask honest countenances. It's no light task, I admit, but a real art. Mr. Fix evidently was not wanting a tinge of self-conceit. Little by little, the scene of the quay became more animated. Sailors of various nations, merchants, shipbrokers, porters, fellas, bustled to and fro as if the steamer were immediately expected. The weather was clear and slightly chilly. The minarets of the town loomed above the houses in the pale rays of the sun. A jetty pier, some two thousand yards long, extended into the roadstead. A number of fishing smacks and co coasting boats, some retaining the fantastic fashion of ancient galleys, were discernible on the Red Sea. As he passed among the busy crowd, Fix, according to habit, scrutinized the passers-by with a keen, rapid glance. It was now half-past ten. The steamer doesn't come, he exclaimed as the port clock struck. She can't be far off now, returned his companion. How long will she stop at Suez? Four hours. Long enough to get in her coal. It is thirteen hundred and ten miles to the, from Suez to Aden at the other end of the Red Sea, and she has to take in a fresh coal supply. And does she go from Suez directly to Bombay? Without putting in anywhere. Good, said Mr. Fix. If the robber is on board, he will no doubt get off at Suez, so as to reach the Dutch or French colonies in Asia by some other route. He ought to know that he would not be safe an hour in India, which is English soil. Unless objected the consul. He is exceptionally shrewd. An English criminal, you know, is always better concealed in London than anywhere else. This observation furnished the detective food for thought, and meanwhile the consul went away to his office. Fix, left alone, was more impatient than ever, having a presentiment that the robber was on board the Mongolia. If he had indeed left London intending to reach the New World, he would naturally take the route via India, which was less watched and more difficult to watch than that of the Atlantic. But Fix's reflections were soon interrupted by a successful succession of sharp whistles, which announced the arrival of the Mongolia. The porters and fellows rushed down the quay, and a dozen boats pushed off from the shore to go and meet the steamer. Soon her gigantic hull appeared passing along between the banks, and eleven o'clock struck as she anchored in the road. She brought an unusual number of passengers, some of whom remained on deck to scan the picturesque panorama of the town, while the greater part disembarked from the boats and landed on the quay. Fix took up a position and carefully examined each face and figure which made its appearance. Presently, one of the passengers, after vigorously pushing his way through the importunate crowd of porters, came up to him and politely asked if he could point out the English consulate, at the same time showing a passport which he wished to have visaged. Fix instinctively took the passport and with a rapid glance read the description of its bearer. An involuntary motion of surprise nearly escaped him, for the description in the passport was identical with that of the bank robber, which he had received from Scotland Yard. Is this your passport? asked he. No, it's my master's. And your master is? He stayed on board. But he must go to the consul's in person as, so as to establish his identity. Oh, is that necessary? Quite indispensable. And where is the consulate? There, on the corner of the square said Fix, pointing to a house two hundred steps off. I'll go and fetch my master, who won't be much pleased, however, to be disturbed. The passenger bowed to Fix and returned to the steamer. 